Tonight, QP and the province hold up at a downtown hotel. If we don't get it, shut it down. With the protests at the government's doorstep, the latest on the failing contract negotiations. And this evening, Peel School Board tells parents its plan for students should education workers walk off the job Friday. And Toronto's Korean community comes together tonight after more than 150 people are killed and sold in a Halloween stampede. Plus, the knees started to buckle, you know, I sort of, sort of got right in where I was like, oh my God, like we realized what we had. The epic catch in the Toronto Harbor that left the fishermen weak in the knees. Good evening, I'm Chris Glover. Supporters of education workers in this province march from the Ministry of Labor to Queen's Park tonight. A show of solidarity for the 55,000 QP members who say they'll walk off the job on Friday. And thousands turned out for the protests. They say the right to demonstrate is what's at issue. The Ford government's proposed back-to-work legislation would impose a contract on the workers and block them from striking. But even with the threat of steep fines, the union insists that the protest will go ahead on Friday, a move that will force many schools across the province to close their doors for the day. And new tonight, Peel District School Board becomes the latest to announce its plans. The board saying students will learn from home on Friday. Still, there is some hope tonight that the province and the union could return to the negotiating table. It comes after a day that began before dawn at Queen's Park, where politicians debated that proposed legislation and calls against it grew louder. Lorenda Redekop begins our coverage tonight. As parents dropped off their kids at school this morning, they wondered, will they be going to class on Friday? By that time, politicians had already spent hours in the legislature. Speaker, I move second reading of Bill 28. And I the 5 a.m. start ensures the required debate and three readings of the bill to pass it this week. We cannot afford to put our young people through another roller coaster of school closures. But today, more voices against the government's plans, including the private sector construction union, Liuna. It supported Doug Ford during his election campaign. Today, one Liuna executive called on the education minister to revoke what he calls anti-union legislation that erodes collective bargaining rights. The prime minister also spoke out about it. Using the notwithstanding clause to suspend workers' rights um, is wrong. I know that, that collective bargaining negotiations are sometimes difficult, but it has to happen. The federal justice minister says his government is looking at how it might challenge this. The opposition says it'll do what it can to stall the legislation, though there are few options. There's no notwithstanding cause that you can use at the grocery store when you can't afford to pay for your groceries or when you can't afford to pay your bills. We don't have these tools as parents, as working people in this province. They don't have that ability and this government shouldn't either. In question period, Premier Doug Ford spoke about this bill for the first time since it was introduced and says union demands for extra pay are too much. We Member are for the Davenport nest to of the head of the QP. Again, we differentiate between labor and labor leadership. They, I think the labor needs to find new labor leadership. QP called the Premier's comments unfortunate and not what's happening. 96% of their members who voted supported a strike. Democracy is not going against the Charter and Rights of Freedoms because you got to get out of jail free card. And that's, Doug Ford is using the notwithstanding clause like a get out of jail free card. Toronto's mayor tried to play the role of peacemaker. I always think it is preferable for people uh, to sit down in a room together. And I, and I always believe, I always believe, no matter what, that there is a possibility that if you sat in the room and just stayed there and, as I've said, had bad coffee and bad sandwiches indefinitely, uh, you would reach a deal. We learned that today both sides were at the hotel, but they weren't in the same room. A government source tells me that their reps, they were there because they were expecting a counteroffer from CUP, but it never came. CUP leader Laura Walton told me that they've been working with the mediator. They've also been poring over this large piece of legislation as they try to come up with their counteroffer. There are still two more days this week that have been set aside for bargaining. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto.
Now to the latest on that shooting that happened yesterday at an East End school. Police have now identified the 18-year-old victim. It happened at Woburn Collegiate in front of horrified students and staff who were leaving the building after classes finished for the day. Ali Shiasan shows us how the community is coping tonight. It was like three or four bangs. Did you see any of the commotion? Did you see? Um, I saw a lot of people running. And then that like clicked in my mind, oh, those bangs must have been gunshots. And then I saw like, I don't, I think it was one or two people collapse. So I ran down there. The shooting happened just after the bell rang. Woburn schoolyard would have been full of students as it was today. I feel unsafe. I feel like there should be a time off for this. This should really take thinking about this and not come back to school like nothing ever happened. It's really sad to be <laughs> honest because this is something that you would hear in America. 18-year-old Jefferson Garrier was shot and killed right here, out front of the high school at Ellesmere and Markham Road. A 15-year-old was also shot and is currently in stable condition in hospital. The range of feelings, great sorrow and just heartbreak for the young people that were involved, their families, their friends. But how do you make kids feel safe the day after a shooting outside school, with police still searching for the suspect, who is also believed to be a teenager? As long as students need uh, the grief counselors and supports, they will be in place. And as well, I'm sure Toronto Police will tell you that they will be here until they feel that they are no longer needed. We're working really closely with Toronto Police. Jefferson Garrier actually wasn't a Woburn student. He went to Lester B. Pearson, just a couple kilometers away. We, we saw him and we played with him before, played basketball and stuff like that. He's been here since 2018 is when he started. He was involved in the school band and he uh, was part of the uh, skateboard club as well. It's actually very scary because something like, like, like that can actually happen here too. This is the second fatal after-school shooting outside of Woburn Collegiate in two years. Mayor John Tory condemned this gun violence in any part of the city. It's one of the reasons why I have uh, initiated a meeting uh, with the school board and the police to see if there's anything more we can do. I just think we're going to have to, um, you know, try even harder to get at some of the root causes of this. Police are looking for a teenage suspect and are asking anyone with information to come forward. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. Toronto's Korean community is also in mourning tonight as South Korea continues to grapple with the loss of more than 150 lives. It happened during a stampede at Halloween celebrations over the weekend. And while some are pointing to an inadequate police response, others say it is time to come together. Dale Manukduk shares their grief. 156 candles flickering for each of the lives lost in Itaewon this past Saturday. The Korean Canadian Cultural Association Center in North York hoping they won't have to light another as it's feared the death toll could still rise. Members of the Korean community stopping to pay their respects and lay flowers at the start of a four day long memorial. Itaewon Sago Samangja Hapdong Bunyan's meaning is Itaewon is the place in Korea that happened, and that the Mon people, that people, all together is in right places in here. In South Korea, the national period of mourning marked by several large vigils, people looking on in tears. The president attending one of those ceremonies also laying flowers, reading notes of condolences for the deceased. <laughs> this woman was in Itaewon the night of the stampede, leaving just before the scene became deadly. She says she wishes she was there to help the other people. <laughs> This man says the young people who attended the celebration were ready to let out pent-up energy after COVID-19 restrictions were lifted. Meanwhile, today, South Korean police admitting their response was inadequate. This man says that every year the government knows about the Halloween celebrations, but did not prepare. At Toronto's Korean Central Presbyterian Church, this pastor says now is not the time to point fingers. This is... Uh, uh, good time and uh, to have uh, morning and uh, pray time, I, I believe that. This past Sunday, the congregation took time to pray for those in Korea and around the world who lost loved ones, including one Canadian. Pastor Lim is specifically thinking about the age of most of the people who died as he has two young adult children of his own. Didn't have uh, uh, most uh, happiness time like uh, uh, 
study in university or some, someone get a job or uh, having a marriage event, proposal moment, they didn't have, right? Dale Manukduk, CBC News, Toronto. The weather was a much needed bright spot for many Torontonians today. November weather feeling anything but. Colette Kennedy is joining us now. Colette, not quite a record, but unseasonably beautiful nonetheless. Thanks, Chris. I mean, what an incredible day, right, to begin this new month of November. Uh, yeah, those temperatures off the charts, about double where we should be for a seasonal high for this time of year. And here's how things kind of played out with that temperature progression. So this is 6 a.m. I know lots of areas were socked in with the fog, and it took uh, a little more time in a few cases than others to see things breaking apart. So even by noon, there were still some problems, even in the downtown core with that cloud cover and a little little bit drizzly but that changed didn't it up to 20 degrees once the sunshine came out and really burned that fog off well we're going to be seeing similar conditions overnight tonight so areas that we don't get the fog development clear skies allowing the temperature to fall off but allow a little extra time again tomorrow morning for your commute just in case because where we get into it it does tend to get quite thick and then it really reduces that visibility. Now, it's gonna be mild tomorrow, just not quite as mild as today. Six for your overnight low and the high tomorrow afternoon up to 14 degrees, Chris. Still looking pretty nice. Thanks, Colette. To Ottawa now, where an organizer of last winter's convoy protest testified at the Emergencies Act inquiry. I don't know the numbers on how many people were here. There was a lot on the weekends. It was, it was very, very busy. It was very busy. And is it fair to say that you couldn't control them all? Absolutely, I could not control them all. Despite leading a group of trucks from Western Canada, trucking company owner Chris Barber testified there was no common leadership. Barber also told the inquiry about internal power struggles within the protest movement that opposed vaccine mandates and COVID restrictions. Several other organizers are set to testify this week. Premier Doug Ford and former Solicitor General Sylvia Jones were also summoned to testify at the inquiry, but the pair have asked a federal court to review it. They're asking for a stay while that review is heard, and that was argued in court today. Talia Ricci picks up that part of the story. Good morning. Lawyers for Ontario Premier Doug Ford and former Solicitor General Sylvia Jones are arguing that not upholding the right to exercise parliamentary privilege would cause irreparable harm to the rule of law and to Ford and Jones on a personal level. The legal immunity prevents a politician from testifying while the legislature is in session and for 40 days before and afterwards. The law on this is actually pretty clear and it's pretty clearly on Doug Ford's side. And the law is that if the assembly is in session, not whether it's sitting, but whether it's in session, he can't be compelled to testify in any court or any commission. And the reason is that the legislative assembly has the first call on Doug Ford's time. In court documents, the commissioner argues Ford and Jones have overstated the privilege and that their application should be dismissed, and that he is legally entitled to Ford and Jones's evidence under its parliamentary mandate. There's nothing stopping him from voluntarily testifying, and in many ways it might be in the public interest that he did testify, but ultimately that's a call for Doug Ford to make. Politicians reacted at Queen's Park today. I don't understand why the Premier is afraid of testifying or why his staff are afraid of him testifying. All he has to say is, here's why I made this decision. I think we as Ontarians deserve to know what were the decisions the government made or didn't make uh, in relation to the occupation of Ottawa and uh, Windsor and the use of the Emergencies Act. But provincial lawyer Susan Keenan says parliamentary privilege is what protects the separation of court and the legislative branch in the proper functioning of a constitutional system. The province argues that not granting a stay would leave politicians open to possible fines, contempt of court or imprisonment if they choose to not testify in any proceeding. It says that could leave politicians unable to do their job. The courts have been doing this and applying this rule for hundreds of years and it would be it would take a brave judge indeed to say that all of the other judges over those hundreds of years were wrong today the judge said a decision will be made before november 10th 
the date Ford and Jones are set to testify. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. Your next hydro bill may come with a bit of a pleasant surprise. The Ontario Energy Board has announced a decrease in the cost of electricity for residential and small business customers, and it takes effect today. In Ontario, peak grid demand is over the summer. So when you look at aggregate demand usage, um, generally that's driven by air conditioners in the summertime. So it would be typical to see a slightly lower rate over the winter than it would over the summer. As much as two cents a kilowatt hour, an energy analyst says the drop is not a significant one compared to last winter's decrease in Ontario, but it comes as other province, provinces are raising their rates. Prices for both time of use and tiered plans will go down, and that change will remain in effect until the end of April next year. Welcome back. Here's some good news for you. The Conservation Authority says Toronto's waterfront is getting cleaner and wildlife habitat is improving. No one may know that better than Will Sampson, who is still reeling from a big catch he made in the Toronto Harbour this weekend. He says the muskie he caught is one of the biggest fish he's ever come across in Ontario waters. Once it came beside the boat, uh, once I saw the colours and the shape and everything and realised what it was, that's when the knees, the knees started to buckle, you know, I sort of, <laughs> sort of got right in where I was like, oh my god, like we realised what we had. My name's Will Sampson, I'm a recreational angler in Toronto Harbour and I caught a 43 inch muskie. I thought it was a good sized pike at first, the way it was fighting, you could tell it was a little different, there was a little more weight, had a little more oomph to it I guess. Got it in the net and I'm still in shock. As far as I know this is the first cure muskie, if you will, uh, that has been caught in the harbour. You, know, you want to keep the population healthy, especially a fish that rare in this area. You want to get that fish back in the water as quick as possible, you want to put it back in just as healthy as the way you took it out of the water. I mean hopefully there are some resident muskie that do stay in the harbour and they're not just passing through with the water temps and the bait fish that are in the harbour currently. I mean, maybe it's a sign of things to come. Maybe we'll start catching more of them. Nicely done, Will. That catch has our producer April and me wondering what else may be lurking in those waters down below. But as we look live at Toronto's harbour tonight, you can see mostly clear skies out there after a gorgeous first day of November. We are currently sitting at around 12 degrees downtown and another few mild ones are in store in the days ahead. Let's bring Colette Kennedy back in now for a look at your extended weather forecast. Colette, that warmth is coming with a bit of a catch of its own. Thanks, Chris. Well, you know, there's some patterns when you get into them, you don't mind them. Others can be well, a little troublesome when it comes to the weather. I'm sure a mild pattern is on most people's agenda, something that they'd be enjoying, and we're seeing that this week. But the other thing is the fog. So we get into that scenario again. We've got the longer nights, the air mass cools down. So we're going to see fog development. The sun comes out. We've got high pressure in place. It's going to burn it off, but we repeat. So again, tonight, just like last night, and like the night after we'll be seeing some fog as well. We get into gradual clearing in some areas. It takes a little longer than others, but eventually once that burns off, we do see that temperature coming up. Now, temps mild with variations. And what I mean by that is we're still going to be above seasonal tomorrow, but we're not headed to 20 degrees again. We're talking about just a few degrees above seasonal. Still a really pleasant day, especially into the afternoon hours. So you can see how things play out here all right that fog comes in through the overnight not everywhere we've got some areas in fact back towards windsor i expect you'll be into the clearer skies but sarnia you'll be on the cusp london it took a long time with all that mist through the day today so again some areas where you're likely going to see this then the sun and then we get into that development once again as we go into the next night and early morning hours so that's kind of our pattern the mild pattern that also repeating then Overnight tonight, I look at some of your temperatures here, Leamington at 5 and Windsor as well. And I'm not saying that every single spot where I've put fog on my icon and every one where I haven't are exactly the spots. Because it is patchy in nature, it's sort of hard to depict exactly where it will be. Uh, in general, you can think that close to the lakeshore, we will be seeing some of this developing again, your highs and your lows for tomorrow. Uh, we're looking at that high of 14. 
Thursday 15 and then the upper teens are coming back at us as we're heading into the weekend. So quite a start to November, Chris. Love it. Thanks, Colette. Here's one for you. A goat and a horse walk outside Union Station. No, it is not the beginning of a bad joke. It's actually something that happened this morning downtown. I know, he's a big boy. He's a big, he's a retiree now. They're both retirees. We have our biggest ambassador yet, Winston, who's here to meet one of our first yeah, royal ambassadors. Yeah. This is Turbo the Goat, who was our ambassador in 2015. That's Winston. So famously, oh, Turbo took her. the goat train to the fair. And so today, for the 100th anniversary, we did just the same thing. All right, so there you have it. Turbo the Goat served as the ambassador for the Royal Agricultural Winter Fair back in 2015, officially handing over the reins to retired police horse Winston today. Winston is the fair's largest ambassador to date. The Royal was canceled for the last two years, but returns for a nine-day run at Exhibition Place. But you'll have to wait till later this week. No waiting at the distillery district. This year's Christmas tree has already arrived. After it gets decorated and put up on display, it'll stay there until the end of December 31st. And sometime in early January, it'll come down where it gets actually recycled. It gets turned into mulch, and we actually add it back to Mother Earth as it should be intended. It was driven in early this morning from Weller Tree Service in Bancroft about three hours north of Toronto, and it stands 15 meters tall and will be decorated using more than 2,000 ornaments and 70,000 lights. The official tree lighting ceremony, that is going to happen on November 17th. Certainly a sign of the times. That's our show for you tonight. Thank you so much for watching. Maribel Tarouk has your next local newscast tomorrow at 6. Have a great night, everyone.